comparing test types for the coronavirus. A viewer suggested comparing the different test types, and I think that's a very good idea because there's obviously different tests, and you know, you may presume they're all the same, but obviously they're not. And there are some, you know, questions about some bad quote tests coming out of China. Is that true or not? I'll delve into that in another talk. Today we're going to focus first on the NAT test, nucleic acid amplification technique. So the concept, if you go back and look at the coronavirus, is you know there's a certain shape of the virus, how it looks like on the outside, but you know that the inside the RNA of the virus is very specific to this particular virus. Other viruses wouldn't have this. On the outside, they may look similar, but the inside, this has to be distinct to be the coronavirus. So you see here that they have different proteins. This is S for the spike protein. They think that's how it attaches. This is the RNA and N for nucleus, nucleocapsid. And then there's envelope protein, and then there's some other stuff out here too as well. So if you want to go buy some antibodies, feel free. These are actually all for sort of testing purposes. Uh, you, you don't buy them to inject in yourself. But they made a lot of different antibodies. And so they combined to different parts of the virus. So in the past, we talked about the Abbott test. And so I think today we'll talk about a Cepheid test. It's a different test and uses the polymerase chain reaction, which is the classic standard reaction we use to amplify DNA. I'm going to be using the terms DNA and RNA interchangeably. They're not interchangeable, they're similar, not exactly the same, but the general principles are basically applicable. The idea behind a polymerase chain reaction is that what you want to do is you have some DNA. You want to reproduce and make a whole lot of it so you could do something with it. Say in the olden days, you know, you're trying to grow bacteria so you could test them, or you're trying to grow, you know, flies so you could do some testing on them, it's some experiment on them. So now we're trying to grow DNA or RNA so we could actually do something about it. And so there's this is the classic way. There's different ways, and so the Abbott test actually uses a different method. But the idea is that you need something that is thermostable. So DNA polymerase is just a fancy word for something that extends the length of a DNA molecule, and they call it the TAC polymerase. And it's thermostable, and the reason is because you actually do cycles where you change the temperature. So if you look here, this is a primer. So a primer is a section of the DNA that you match to. See, here matches to here, so it latches on. So the idea is you first have sort of different segments, and then they separate when you heat it up, because proteins denature, shall we say. And then the primers get a bind, and then this polymerase extends it and creates it. And so they're saying this at first stage in nature, you heat it up so they separate. And then anneal, you get the primers, and then use the tack polymerase, you heat it up a little bit more because it works better at this temperature, extend it, and then you have doubled. And just keep running it and running it until you get more and more and more. And then after you get more, then you could substitute something else for the primer called a probe. And so the idea of a probe is something that attaches. And so this probe has a fluorescent tag. They have different ways of tagging, but fluorescent is one way, and a machine could pick it up. They're like, oh, it lit up. Hey, I found a thing of interest, right? Because you don't want to just find any old DNA or any old RNA. It might be some other viruses, and I don't really care if I have the flu or I have this or that, right? I only want the coronavirus, COVID-19. So let's look at a real test. So this is the FDA information for a real transfluorescent RT-PCR kit for detecting SARS-CoV-2, 50 reactions per kit. This is very, very complicated. They go into a lot of detail. This is obviously meant for a big laboratory, 
like one at a big academic university or something. So, you know, they talk about all these things and, you know, basically if you work in a lab, you would know how all these things work. You could have this PCR system, you could have this PCR system. Um, they'll, they'll work with either one. You gotta have some of these things for cleaning it. DNA zap, it's something that destroys DNA. RNA is away, destroys RNA. Lots of these little things. Lots of details. They talk about how to prevent contaminants from exogenous RNA. There's a lot of quality control issues here. And if you look, the temperatures are very specific. You could treat transfer at negative 18 degrees in the dark. That's it. They tell you how to collect the samples. They tell you how to mix the reagents. So the idea is that you could have the DNA or RNA inside, but you need to extract it. Get it out so you can work with it. They tell you how to sort of run the system. You have different graphs here. A different system. And finally, they talk about quality control. These labs have performed their own quality control. See, a kit in the field, like the Abbott kit, there's, you know, you just sort of use it, right? You presume they've done their own quality control. In the hospital, you'll find that actually they have to do quality control. All the instruments like the blood pressure cuffs and all that stuff, they have to be quality control. People have to check on it every now and then to make sure it's valid. And then they talk about what, how to interpret things. It's obviously very complicated. Look at the sigmoid application, the CT value. So, and then they talk a lot of detail about sort of, you know, limitations. So, yeah. Um, so this is a pretty good test, obviously. They talk about limits of detection 100, and they're still pretty good at 100. Remember the Abbott test was 125? Didn't really work at 125. They only tested on 250. This is pretty good. Go into a lot more detail. Lots of information on testing. What else do they test on other things? Okay, and how much exactly, right, of these other viruses to make sure you don't get a positive result just because they have other viruses? This is really wonderful, but it's meant for a lab, not for normal people to use. So yes, there is the Abbott test that everybody knows about because President Trump had it. In his briefing so yes it's a molecular point of care test but it's actually a little bit different than the tests we're going to talk about today so this actually uses isothermal meaning they don't have to heat things up you remember for PCR they heat it up to denature the protein so you could use it again sort of so you have different cycles so this one doesn't heat things up and so there's a lot of different methods um, I don't know what Abbott uses exactly I couldn't figure it out but, you know, in terms of the general gist of the thing, COV2, if you have a virus that before, causes COVID-19, has just received emergency use authorization from the FDA. So here it you see. It begins with a clinician collecting a patient sample. The patient sample is mixed in a tube. They actually say specifically, shake it up five times. Using the included pipette, this is then transferred into the Cepheid cartridge, which already includes the testing reagents. The lid is snapped closed, and the cartridge is ready to place into the GeneXpert system. So the GeneXpert is a system you have to have yourself, or you have to buy it. I looked it up, I think for a four-thing system, it's about 30 grand. So not free, but, you know, not, yeah, not too expensive in the relative scheme of things. So I went ahead and looked up the expert SARS-CoV-2 test. And I found it very interesting that they have a lot more details here than the Abbott test, even though the FDA gave emergency use authorization to both. But I think their test is a lot better. So first of all, they use 
real-time PCR, and they say, once again, it's qualitative, right? They're going to give you sort of a yes or a no, not going to give you the exact number. And they talk about the different ways you've collected. They have, you know, four different ways here. A lot of disclaimers, talking about principles, how you do stuff, right? As I mentioned before, you know, when they were talking about how to use it, I think that's really good that they said, you know, they first of all, they show you how to use it here, how you're supposed to do exactly different swabs, and they tell you what you do for preparing a cartridge. They said, by inverting the specimen transfer hoop five times. Huh? That's pretty simple. Five times is very exact. Don't shake it well for a minute or whatever. Different people shake different amounts, right? So they just said inverting it, not even shaking it. So as we saw already, you put it in, and then you run the test. So they actually go into the possible results here, and they talk about N2 and E. So remember going back to this N, remember N in around the nucleus where the DNA or RNA is included N2. So it's a segment two of that. And then E is the envelope protein. So yeah, um, if they test for the nucleus, right, then you got it, right? Yeah, that's sort of, you know, hard to say, right? And I think this is sort of the idea that they're saying which one is more conserved. So they're not actually testing for the protein, right? They're testing for the RNA here that creates the protein. I think they're gist of it is that this is uh, more conserved as you know remain the same across different variants of the coronavirus and this may change a little bit so they're not going to put as much trust into it and they tell you how to interpret your results when to retest how to retest talk about limitations right about transporting so for the abbott test they're saying now that it's actually not good transported and so abbott has actually redone their authorization and saying no, 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 you can't keep it for days. You just have to run it there then and now. Because they, there's been reports that it's not very good if you don't run it then, if you just use the sort of transport medium. And so, again, they have a limit of detection, and they test it, and it's all looking good, right? And here are the other ones that they test for, you know, the high priority organisms that they make sure that, you know, they don't mix up and say a positive. And here are their references. So I think that, you know, the there's a lot of people that have started testing both of these things. They test, they have different machines, they try the different machines. A lot of these big labs, they could do all this testing in cells, and the gold standard is obviously the PCR, and they have that. And so they compare it to the PCR in their big humongous machine and see how these more point of care tests work. And, you know, some people are saying the Abbott test is good enough. Some people are saying, yeah, it's not catching a lot of these sort of people that have low levels. And so they're saying the Cepheid test is a lot better. But these are both American companies. These are both companies that are, quote, supposed to be pretty good. And the idea is that, you know, Obviously, different companies make tests in different ways, and some of it could be a constraint. The Abbott test is sold as less than 15 minutes, right? Depending on whether it's positive or negative, you know, 13 minutes, or is it 5 minutes? But the idea is that, you know, they're all companies that are sort of big, established companies. And so the question is, when you say these companies in China, they're selling bad tests. Well, you know, what do you mean? Because there is no perfect test. I mean, the perfect test is running a PCR in your big machine in the lab, but that's just not practical, right? You can't do what we call point of care. You can't have a little machine and have non-technical people run that. It just wouldn't work. So I think the idea is what makes a good test? So first of all, you have to know what kind of test it is. So PCR versus, you know, and other things, but the gold standard is still this NAAT NAT nucleic acid amplification because we were just testing for the actual presence of the RNA of the virus, its genetic code. And you think, well, if that's present, you know, then it's good. But first of all, you have to make sure you extract it because it's hidden inside, right? If it's inside, then, you know, it's no good. You can't, you can't, your probe is not going to reach it if it's still hidden inside a lot of different proteins. 
So you've got to figure out some way of extracting it first. But presuming that works well, then if you have the presence of that material, even a very low amount, because we're able to amplify it so much, we think we catch such low levels, then we think we got it. But a lot of the other tests are using antigen testing, which is testing for the outside, all these things, right? And so I think that's what we'll talk about our next talk in sort of comparing that testing to sort of PCR NAT testing, which is our gold standard. Keeping in mind that even with NAT testing, some sort of method of amplifying may be better than other methods, like the Cepheid test seems to be better than the Abbott ID NAT test.